Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Welcome, everybody, to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. In today's episode, I'm continuing with one of the most important factors for successful leaders, the concept of self-differentiation. The past three episodes have focused on these concepts, starting with episode 92, The Leader's Kryptonite, Emotional Fusion versus Differentiation gives the context for the entire series. If you've wondered why you can't seem to get the wins that you've worked so hard for, why the family, the team, the organization can't seem to get the wins, even after training with conferences or counselors, consultants, books, podcasts, and mentors. I want you to know this episode is for you. In the previous three episodes, I shared first in episode 92, an overview of self-differentiation, what differentiation is as a way to mitigate the rumbling anxiety that compels disruptions to life, teams, and organizations. Anxiety should not be thought of as just big old expressions. Anxiety can be extremely subtle. It appears as mild irritations, frustrations, eye-rolling, gossip, blame, and so much more. Self-differentiation always begins with a clear sense of self-definition. Again, self-differentiation always begins with a clear sense of self-definition or identity. As Steve Cuss defines it, differentiation is the ability to be fully yourself while being fully connected to people. It's gaining clarity on where I end and the other begins. A A differentiated person allows space between himself or herself and another, even when that other person is highly anxious or asking for a rescue. A differentiated leader is clear on his or her own values and convictions and is not easily swayed from them. Differentiation is not about neglecting content, what is being said, but adding the ability to pay attention to process. And that is how people are relating and perhaps most powerful, powerfully how they are affecting your own anxiety. This is verbal content versus emotional processing. How does anxiety look in your own leadership profile or your marriage or your parenting? How does it show up in your organizational culture or your team members presentation in the group? Let me read just a list of anxiety-driven characteristics from Peter Scazzaro. He's the author of Healthy Spirituality. He's written several books. He's one who's taken family systems theory and put it into church worlds in, in church thought. So think of yourself and associate how anxiety might drive this in you. Then think of the people you lead, your teammates within the organization, and ask how anxiety might be driving them. I compare myself a lot to other people. Is that you? Maybe that's a teammate. I often say yes when I prefer to say no. I often don't speak up to avoid the disapproval of others. People close to me would describe me as defensive and easily offended. Is that you? Is that a profile of a team member or somebody who's in the group that you're endeavoring to be a part of? Uh, I have a hard time laughing at my shortcomings and failures. I avoid looking weak or foolish in social situations. I'm not always the person I appear to be. I struggle with taking risks because I could fail or look foolish. My sense of worth or well-being comes from what I have, that's possessions, what I do, that's accomplishments, and what others think of me, that's popularity. I often act like a different person when in different situations and with different people. Is that you or perhaps somebody on your team and your family or in your group? There's other ways subtle anxiety shows up. Overfunctioning, 
blaming others, overwhelming others with multiple issues, playing the victim, being closed, not open to finding a solution, defensiveness to constructive feedback, and always needing to give heightened levels of justification, and or neglecting to own up to mistakes, or not responding or listening to other people's perspectives, or being inconsiderate of time and limited resources. And when anxiety is growing on a team for you, it may just feel toxic. Your signaling may be, I just feel like something is completely off here. Or you find yourself questioning your own competence in the group. You emotionally find that you are diminishing your sense of self. All of these characteristics point to a non-differentiated self, perhaps in you and perhaps within various team members or family members that you serve. I have had multiple discussions with my psychologists and therapist colleagues about this experience of self-diminishing and questioning, and they all agree that when they, they have this feeling, when they feel this, they begin activating awareness, they get their radar out that the client is most likely diagnosable with a personality disorder. That's wild, isn't it? The feelings within the professional are due to the client transferring their own anxiety viruses onto the professional, hoping that the professional is going to take the virus and be responsible for what the client is supposed to own in responsibility to manage their own fear. So the professional can make uh, help make sense of the anxiety and give tools and coaching to the client, but the responsibility of managing the anxiety is solely on the client themselves. A good professional will not allow themselves to be triangulated into the anxiety. It's interesting to note that so many of these subtle anxiety expressions are socially acceptable and publicly rewarded type functions. Things like perfectionism, overachieving, restricted food or undereating, excessive exercising, people pleasing, powering through, not taking breaks or vacations, prioritizing career over a personal life, being a yes person, chronic workaholism, over scheduling, functioning on a few hours of sleep. Isn't it true? These often are not only publicly acceptable or socially acceptable, they're publicly rewarded. So that was episode 92. Then we get into 93 and I shared the foundation to a healthy differentiation and that it is to have a healthy self-definition or identity. So I created the acrostic A-R-T, art, and call this the art of identity. Awareness is the A in the acrostic art. Awareness of how your own historical story has evolved into your present emotional processes. Awareness is the first step to having a healthy emotional sense of self. So we gave you a bunch of exercises to build the muscles of awareness. You will never calm the anxieties that you are first, you got to be aware of. You'll never calm the anxieties you're unaware of and that you live with. And then secondly, where these anxieties have coded into your nervous system, and now that it's normalized expressions of your personality, until you're aware of that, you're never going to have a healthy sense of self. And then thirdly, you got to know how. Be aware of how to recode the nervous system through top-down cognitive strategies or bottom-up trauma root strategies. So that was episode 93. Then in 94, I shared the second component of art, the acrostic, the R in art. R is for responsibility. Taking responsibility for the management of one's own anxiety and reactivity and issues. Rather than transmitting the anxiety onto others in hopes of mitigating it in yourself by giving them the burden. Responsibility helps us disengage trying to change others, other people, to trying to change ourselves. It's taking responsibility. And when we take responsibility for ourselves by managing anxiety from the inside out, rather than thinking that others must be the cause of the anxiety, and if they're the cause, they have to be the solution. What this does when we know that it's coming from the inside out, it causes both a calming presence to be transmitted and trains the team, family, or friends in their own processes of becoming differentiated. 
When we take on anxiety responsibility and refuse to accept the anxiety of others while at the same time staying connected to them, we ironically train them how to take responsibility for their own anxiety management. So that was episode 94 and we gave you the exercises there to build the muscles of responsibility. Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. My name is Patrick Norris and I am a husband, father, pastor of 35 years and a strategic therapeutic mentor to leaders in all arenas of life. I am an inerrantist, a Calvinist Armenian betweenist, a Holy Spirit continuist and a finished work of Christ redemptionist. Red Ink Revival was designed to create a revival in the heart, soul and brains of Christian leaders from all spheres of influence. Our team of pastors, psychologists and therapists facilitate our life-changing leadership personal growth, and emotional wholeness experiences. Our goal is to bring a revival, an integrated wholeness to pastors, church staff, the local church, and the universal Big C Church around the world. This includes marketplace leaders, educators, foster adoptive parents, and so much more. If this podcast is providing value to you, would you consider subscribing to it wherever you get your podcast? Also, please like the episodes, comment on them, and share them on your social media feeds. And one more big, big favor. If you like the show, please go review it at Apple. And if it's true of you, give us five stars. Now let's go back to this week's episode. Well, today in episode number 95, I want to give you the truth. Truth is the T in art, the art of self-definition or identity. The A again is awareness, R is responsibility, and now truth, truth. Truth is about clarity. This speaks to what we believe is true. Truth is another word to describe reality. What's real? What is absolute? Truth is what I'm willing to commit to so that I can be a healthy, flourishing human being. Truth is my foundation. It is the fabric of self. It refers to the idea of when I pull everything back, this is the essence of who I am. This is me without pretense, impression management, protection techniques, or a default armament. We all like to build armor around ourselves and it is our presentation to the world. So truth is me, all of me, without pretense, without impression management, protection techniques, or default armament. Truth is about who I believe I really am. And when what I believe about me is both cognitive and emotional, aligned and without contradiction, I live as a free person in life. I bring a calm presence into every environment I come into. Others are going to be able to feel it, this peace and calming presence, And they will also be inspired by it. Truth first is going to require clarity. Truth cannot be ambiguous, cloudy, or undefined. Truth is about honoring the values, perspectives, opinions, convictions, interpretations, beliefs, desires, and goals that I have with commitment and with integration or integrity. That means that it all is aligned. It's not fragments here, there, and yon, and I'm just kind of juggling them. Truth is about honoring the true sense of what I believe and know. To be a self-defined person, a person with a clear sense of identity, we must define and clarify what is true for us. To be a healthy, flourishing human being, we must have the freedom to be separate from others while reaching into the others for connection. We have to know where others' values, perspectives, and beliefs end and where ours begins and is separate than theirs. Even when they're placing pressure on us, to fuse with theirs. I love that. Truth means that we really know what's important to us, to know what is our values, what our convictions are, what our goals are, what our beliefs are, what our opinions are, and what we really want in life. A great question you might ask yourself is, what would I die for and what's not worth it? Understanding truth and knowing that our identity comes from internal processes 
that this sense of our reality comes from within and not from being defined by others enables us to stand firm in our convictions in a healthy way. Truth empowers our self-definition. Who I am. What do I believe? What is important to me? What are my values? And how, how do I see things? You may be thinking that these questions and really the ease of answering them is somewhat presented with exaggeration and is completely romantic. I mean, who in the world actually knows? It's the paradox of thinking the pursuit of what is real is unrealistic. <laughs> the, the paradox of the pursuit of what is real is unrealistic. Sometimes people will say, I don't know who I am or what I want. Sometimes parts of me wants to do one thing or believes one thing. And then a little bit later, I want and believe something else. Well, that's true, right? That's true. Well, what is also true is that you get to decide what you want, when you want, and have the freedom to pivot what you want as you decide. That is truth. That is real. You get the right to define who you are and what you want. You decide to no longer be defined by other people's emotions, judgments, opinions, beliefs. It's important to be able to ask yourself, do I have the right to define myself? Do I have the right to be myself? Can I define myself? So explore what you believe and how you would define your opinion on a topic. Do this even before you take you into any relationship or job or opportunity. And it's never too late. If you're already in a relationship, job, or opportunity, begin clarifying these things for yourself right now. Explore and commit to where you're at in this season of your life. Even if you're scared and not ready to share an I statement or a specific position or to tell people how you feel, you want to get to clarity and clarify what you believe about yourself, life, and God and others just in general for yourself. Explorations and questions that you can ask yourself to help you define and find what is clear. What do I think is important? What are my values? What are my morals? What do I tend to protest? What do I have emotional opinions on? How do I tend to profile specific individuals? You know what I'm talking about. What are my clarifying in intuitions or uh, about various subjects? Or what is my intuition about various people that I'm just so unclear and unsure about that I don't want to even explore them? Or how do I understand and process how the other person is reading or reacting to me or acting in general? And then here is how I'm reading them. What do I believe about it? What do I believe about who they are? So resolve that I have the right to own my own thoughts. I have the right to my own beliefs. Beliefs. What do I believe? What do I think? How do I see things? This is what I believe, right or wrong. And I could even be wrong. Even if wrong, I'm okay with showing up as the real me and reflecting how I might be able to grow in and about something, whatever that thing is. This isn't the kind of rebellious showing up that sometimes we see people doing. It isn't showing up to mitigate the anxiety for somehow being finally celebrated. Rebellious showing up is an anxiety expressing itself by presenting a tough person, a powerful person, a stylish person, or a fill-in-the-blank person that isn't sure who they really are. The reactivity to anxiety is the toxic part of it. A person who's at peace within themselves can freely show up with any personality expression, not to gain something or to calm something, but to experience the joy of just simply being God's creation. So why do we have struggles to do this clarifying work of who we are and who we are not? Believe it or not, the fear of truly committing to a value, opinion, belief, or overall presentation of self is rooted in our heart, soul, and brain's programming from our childhood stories. Hey, have you ever wanted to explore how your backstory is influencing your present story? 
Have you ever wondered why you were driven the way you were driven or why you want the things you so deeply want or why you might be triggered the way you're triggered? Maybe there's something in your life that keeps derailing you or exposing the fractures in your heart and soul. At Red Ink Revival, I facilitate groups of six to 10 men or six to 10 ladies in an exploration process that includes worksheets, tools for discovery, and insights into personal motivations, torments, and reactions. And it's all done online through Zoom in a short six-week experience. Now don't worry, you won't be required to share anything you don't want to. Your story is yours to share when and where you're ready. But first, you owe it to yourself to know what that story actually is. Our alumni report having life-changing experiences and integrations in all spheres of life. They report it actually felt like they entered into a revival. They even say they now lead others like never before as they instinctively map their teammates' own story considerations. We're developing groups specific for individual classifications like senior pastors or spouses, church staff, educators, foster adoption parents, marketplace leaders, and churches at large. Go to redinkrevival.com and find the events tab to learn more. It could be from past hurts, traumas, abuses, disappointments, unmet needs, attachment injuries, complicated family dynamics, or more. We often live so afraid of being wrong that we refuse to commit to any belief, thought, or truth at all. As, and I get this name kind of screwed over, but be patient, Gary Wittevergongel. So R W I T T E V R O G N R O G R O N G E L. I butchered it nonetheless. But this guy makes this statement on a podcast I heard. I made a commitment to mediocrity so that I would never come into view. I was in a commitment to invisibility. It, I will not be seen, he said. I will not be humiliated. He went on to say, I always avoided leadership. The sense of being out front and being seen terrified me because being seen always led to some sort of abuse down in my story. You see, we live in a time within history where we want to be invisible. We're extremely cautious about becoming known or truly, truly authentically felt and heard. We live in this time of history where there is such a saturation with media and others' opinions and culture canceling. You can see it on the news. You can see it in social media. You see it on Facebook and Instagram. You see it everywhere. Our subconscious processes are aware of this and it frames, it frames the whole thing up as a threat that a predator is going to devour our entire worth, survival and belonging if in fact we give any room for somebody to see vulnerability in us or that we were wrong. So our fear of being shamed, embarrassed or exploited is heightened and coded into our nervous systems and we assume that if we really define who we are and present a thought that for some reason, if it wasn't very credible or defensible, that we will be crushed by society or by the ones who we are holding on to, to love us still. We'll get more into radical acceptance and give answers to that in a couple of weeks when we talk about the why in artsy. Art is about self-definition. C, S, Y is about our self-regulation. Re, uh, y is about you. And in it, we're going to dig down on why often we don't have compassion to ourselves. That we're so worried about what other people think about us that we're holding out. We are having a contingency that we will not love ourselves richly, kindly, or generously until whatever you fill in the blank, until you achieve, until you're sure that nobody can come down on you. In other words, we're holding out this very integrated, peaceful, shalom relationship to self until others' opinions become solidified around us. So here's the point I'm making. 
We can't define ourselves for what we are or what we are not until we commit to various things. This commitment, commitment is just isn't about being task oriented. Well, I have to choose something. It's more about uh, exploring. If we're going to ever get down to the very bottom, to the root of living in truth, if we're ever going to organically and fully embrace the truth of who we are, we've got to explore these commitments that we've already made or want to make, but somehow or other have not acknowledged or not fully owned due to, the, to these fears of other people's opinions. And what these fears do is they hold us as, as a hostage and we become petrified to move in these areas. The safest place we feel is to exist in being undefined. So we inadvertently make no commitments that create demarcations in our design. There are no forms or necessary focus for who we are, who we aren't. There are no colorations, no shades, no textures, no angles to us. We're just the blur behind other objects from a D. SLR camera, just the blur behind objects, undefined. We've learned to default to live in the no man's land of no commitment. In other words, we go into relationships not having committed to anything related to self or any beliefs or anything that might not be popular with others. So we must begin to intentionally change that in our self-definition. We must define, this is what I believe. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this that I believe. I'm not sure if I'm going to share it with the people around me or anyone at all. But this is what I believe. I've decided I believe, think, and interpret things in this definitive way. I'm committed to it. Right or wrong in my assessments, I'm committed to it. I am even committed to not knowing fully what I think about a thing. I'm I'm willing to not know what I think about and hold myself with honor and grace without having to feel the shame of somebody else on the outside feeling like I'm incompetent as a result of not committing to something. And so I have a commitment to self-definition. Our commitment is to one of these three. Yes, I believe whatever fill in the blank is. Or no, I don't believe whatever the fill in the blank is. Or I'm not sure yet. And I'm not ready to decide, but I'm committed to being okay in this space. That is still amazing self-definition. A commitment to one of, uh, of the three of yes, no, and I don't know. One of, one of these commitments gives clarity, any one of them, of what you can do next. If you decide to believe a thing, what do you now have the freedom to do with this choice. Again, if you decide, yes, I believe this thing, now what do you have in the terms of freedom to do with that choice? If you decide you don't believe something, what do you now have the power to do next? If you aren't sure you know what step you wanna take, then you can do a couple of things. You could be intentional about researching what you believe. Or you can resolve, look, man, this piece of opinion doesn't rank high enough in my priority list. So your self-definition is just that. I don't find it important enough to have a definitive opinion on this. That's my opinion. <laughs> my opinion is I don't have an opinion. Even then, even then you don't have to comply with anyone else's opinions or their pressures. So you hold on to yourself. And as they try to make you into something for their own purposes, you can say, look, that's your opinion. Your anxiety may be driving you for me to make a decision, but it's not mine to own. So self-definition and identity and now self-differentiation requires that we know what we feel and think about things. This is what I think about the situation and the relationship. Maybe it is giving connected honesty for instance, you might say, I think our relationship is hurting. When you do, and whatever the activity is, when you do whatever, I experience that you are being selfish. I'm not saying you are selfish, but that's what the narrative and emotions I began to feel. And I wanted to invite you into my experience of that. Then my thoughts move from that 
to, I think I'm trying harder. I, I, I have this experience that I think I'm trying harder than you are on our relationship. So you're using I statements. What I just did there is I'm not projecting weapons down or uh, bullets being shot at the individual. I'm saying this is how I'm experiencing it. That's all. I'm not saying it's accurate or true. I'm telling you how I'm experiencing it. What I'm doing is I'm showing up in a self-differentiated self where I'm allowing myself to be seen, felt, and heard. So a differentiated partner in response to what I just said. So if the a uh, partner is the one who uh, is is hearing the statements that I just made about I'm trying harder than you are. This is how they might respond with connected honesty as well. Connected honesty just means that I have an emotional connection to you, but I'm providing honesty about who I am. And so it could be said in, in response, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Share with me how I can support you with whatever you're feeling in this. And if there's anxiety here, what if we were to explore what that anxiety actually is? And if you can give me some solutions to bless you and help you feel seen and celebrated, I'm happy and desirous to do that. The deeper roots though, if this is an anxiety piece, the deeper roots of anxiety are something I'm not capable of actually fixing for you because it's internal. Maybe we could see a therapist to know where the anxiety in me is that keeps me from doing some of the things that I can in the relationship. And maybe the therapist can explore the anxieties that could be in you, not saying it is, but could be in you that make you feel like my behavior has to fit a certain criteria for you to be okay and fulfilled. How would you like to reboot your personal finances this year? How would you like to take control of your money, turning small wins into big results? I want to encourage you to check out my wife, Tina's financial coaching business at tinanorris.org. You might be wondering, what is a financial coach? A coach is someone who will personally team up with you to outline financial goals, inspire you with energy, help you stay focused on your goals, and so much more. You can do it all through Zoom, and she provides a free initial consultation. So there's no pain or cost to you for your first steps. Maybe you've been to several Financial Peace University cycles, left with great intentions, but struggled to execute. You need a trainer, a coach, another human that won't shame or judge you to help you stay on track. She works with clients that are single parents, everyday people, pastors and church staff, as well as high income professionals. If you have friends, church members, clients, or even young marrieds that are launching their financial lives, you will do them all a favor to have them check out this amazing option. If professional athletes need a coach to win the day to fulfill their dreams, then you and I do too. And you won't find anybody better to help you get there than Tina Norris. Set up your free consultation from anywhere in the world today. Go to tinanorris.org to find out all the details. Now remember, at this point, even if the opinion, belief, or embodied trait is something related to a thousand other things, you, if you don't want to share it with anyone at all, you don't have to. But for your own health and identity information, at least you need to be tuned into what you think and feel about specific situations and people. So this very uh, role-playing scenario where one's feeling like they're working on the relationship harder than the other, stay in I conversation and be curious about your own emotional states, but tune in to the process, the emotional process of your partner, not the content of what they're saying. This particular partner that says, I feel like that we're hurting in the relationship and I experience that you're being selfish. Well, that just is emotionally presenting that they're suffering in some way, that something on the inside of them is under threat. And so our true compassion and empathy wants to reach in to see what we can do to help. Now, if we have a, a judgment, if we have a thought, if we have a belief, and if we are wrong in that judgment, 
we now have something we can grow from. If we're wrong and we put it on the table, we can grow. If we're invisible, we don't show up, I promise you, we won't grow. Growth requires a commitment to something, to believe something, think something, have values about something. So, how, however, when we think about all this stuff, to linger in this space of no man's land, having no commitment, I promise you, we're, you, I, we're all going to remain in turmoil. No commitments and vague awareness of opinions are going to open the brain's survival mechanisms to target everything and everybody because everything and everybody is a threat against us because it sees everything and everybody as the enemy. Specifying what you believe will relieve anxiety because something has now been committed to and the good news is you have the right to change your mind as you grow. So what if you aren't sure of what you believe? Then commit to that as a present reality for yourself. Maybe you're not ready to have a position on a certain thing or, or person yet. Then own that as a definitive marker. I'm not ready. And no one can make me be ready for that. Nobody can make me, make me, make me. No, Because I'm differentiated. I'm an identity. I'm separate. But I can still be connected without giving people what they need to fulfill or satisfy their anxiety. Identity or self-definition is critical for our emotional health and all of our relational successes. For identity to become grounded, it must be sourced from an objective source of truth rather than a subjective theory or theories of truth. While emotions and feelings are beneficial gifts to serve our awareness and they signal us of happenings like the gauges on a car dashboard, they are not reliable sources. They're unreliable, unable to anchor us in objective truth. Emotions and feelings are gifts from God to help us experience life. But the information they give us aren't always. That information is just not always accurate, nor is it consistent. Many of our emotional and feelings reactivity is based in a lifetime of negligence, trauma, and suffering. All of us have emotional framework that is forged by our early adaptations to mom's anxieties, dad's anxieties, and siblings' anxieties. This is where we learn to adapt by reading the nonverbal and highly emotional mapping that we scan for concerning who our primary caretakers are and what they need. This scan was our early on reading of what we must do to adapt so that we secure survival and belonging in that system. And it became our brain's attachment pattern for all relationships moving forward. The philosophical and now practical question is, what's real? What's true? And how do we find it? Know this, whoever or whatever defines reality will be elevated as our ultimate authority. And this, who or what, we practically serve as the source of ultimate authority is going to function as our God. I want you to consider that. I'm going to say the whole thing again. You got to know this, whoever or whatever defines reality for you, that is elevated as your ultimate authority. This is the who or what that you practically and I practically serve as a God. You know, an example is the scientific community is working really hard to define reality or what is real. And I love that. However, if science, or more accurately, the interpretation of science, is my ultimate source of knowing what is real, I have become its servant. Keep in mind that many people will say, well, follow the science. But as you zoom out, you're going to see opposing voices pointing to the science and saying, follow the science. <laughs> and so what is meant is follow my interpretation of the science. Again, you have two opposing views, both yelling and waving the flag and follow the science. So ultimately it is follow my interpretation of the science. Scientific interpretation isn't to be diminished from its profound role that helps us have color, depth, and texture in all of our understanding. But if scientific interpretation 
has been filtered by biases, emotional fusion with agendas, traumatic experiences, or other internal vows and agreements, it will take us to the most unreliable and unreal places that make us vulnerable to harm. It will make our sense of self, our self-definition and identity come to a complete structural collapse. It is in these subjective theories of truth that a little boy can identify as a dog and some will even celebrate that he's discovered his true identity. Those fused will even advocate for others to pet the little boy, play fetch and give him a doghouse outside to validate his identity. Now, it is true that he's identifying emotionally as being a dog, but the truth would say he's still yet a human. This isn't subjective, it's objective. Theories based on emotions and fusion with another person's suffering will always lead to the collapse of healthy identities. The only way to have a healthy identity is to find an objective source. For a Christian, the formation of identity is rooted in the truth and authority of Scripture. While we acknowledge that there are various ways to interpret the text, sometimes offering opposing views, the scripture is a place for discovery for how God identifies us. Now, again, we give room for all these different perspectives, people having opinions of the text. But if the text is organically viewed as being authoritative, and then we have good uh, exposition, good interpretation skills, and we come up with opposing views, that is completely different than if somebody doesn't at all believe that the scripture is true. Now, for a Christian who is a Bible authority inerrancy of scripture kind of person, a, a guy or gal, then what we do is we root into what that truth is, and it becomes this discovery of how God is identifying us. So, from a Christian worldview, a scriptural worldview, God is the creator and designer. God is the creator and designer. So, logic would have that a creator would only create something for a purpose. I need you to breathe for a moment. Logic would have that a creator, if God is the creator and designer, that a creator would only create something for a purpose. Otherwise, it's unintelligent. While non-creator observers, so... When God is a creator, other observers who didn't create might be looking on, tend to see what has evolved. These observers watch the development or the evolution and see what presently is, which can give the observer cause to believe the intended purpose of that which is created is what is rather than what was designed. I want you to, again, breathe for a minute and process what I just said. God's the creator and designer, and logic would say to us that a creator would only create something for a purpose, at least an intelligent creator would. And so you can have observers that are not the creator, but they're watching, and they can see what is has evolved for this creation, where it is today, how a fallen world is beat and shoved down and wounded and injured, and see what this created thing presently is. And it could give that observer cause to believe that the intended purpose for this creation is what is rather than what was designed. Only, and this is so important, only the creator will have a clear perspective of the created thing's purpose. Pastors, did you know that upwards of 70% of the men in your congregation are regularly accessing pornography, stuck in shame, torn in conflict, and therefore immobilized for zealous ministry? That's seven out of 10. The problem is not gonna go away. What are you doing to lead your men into wholeness? Porn and sex addiction is characterized by undesirable compulsive behaviors that feature incongruence with personal values and it interferes with normal living, causing stress on their relationships with God, family, friends, loved ones, and possibly even their own work environment. Well, where do you send men to recover and become both whole and integrated? Red Ink Recovery offers a unique program exclusive to porn and sex-related addictions. Our clinical professionals, our psychologists and therapists have created a transformative treatment process that collects the dots, connects the dots, and corrects the dots that have driven the addictions. 
Our approach heals the heart, restores the soul, and rebuilds the neuroplasticity of the brain. Our clients find their lives have been wildly marked by Christ as they are given a path for trust being rebuilt. And they are resourced for far greater relationships and intimacy than they have ever known before. All of our professional teammates are experts in the field of sexual addiction. They are all trained by Dr. Patrick Carnes and certified by the International Institute of Trauma and Addiction Professionals. Dr. Carnes is known as the father and curator of modern sexual addiction recovery as a movement. Pastors, we encourage you to recommend your men who struggle to come to one of our intensives. If you are a, just a simple man that struggles, maybe you're new to the faith or you don't even know what you believe about Christ, be encouraged to join us. We will honor your journey and give you the tools to live in wholeness. To find out more about our porn and sex addiction intensives and when the next one is, go to redinkrevival.com. When talking about what is true and real, we must begin at what the Creator would define as perfectly real or reality. All attempts by observers, and observers includes the created thing observing their own uh, evolution. So this is about you. So any observer, whether it's an outside onlooker to us or our own sense of self looking at ourselves, any attempt by an observer to define their own reality is always going to be partial. It'll be skewed and it'll be malleable. It'll constantly be changing and fluctuating as new pressures, new perspectives are added into it. As an example of limited perspective, uh, I saw this picture recently of Prince William and uh, I'll share it descriptively. Um, the picture is Prince William standing outside a limousine. And there are actually two pictures from two different angles on this one picture. And it's the exact same picture, but from two different angles. The top picture shows the angle from the side of Prince William. And it looks as though he is flipping somebody off with the international sign of one middle figure. However, the bottom picture shows the same event, same moment, same picture, but this is from a different angle. It's from in front of Prince William. And it shows that it wasn't one finger that was being held up. It was actually three fingers. He was doing it like this. If you're on YouTube, you see that I'm holding up my smallest finger all the way up the three digits. And it, of course, would look from an angle like he was flipping somebody off. Well, this is an illustration of what happens when we allow emotions and fusion with other people's suffering to become our source of truth. Reality from a Christian biblical perspective is that not everything you see is all there is. The way things are is not always the way, thing they, the way things were designed. Therefore, truth transcends experiences, and therefore truth is transcendent but knowable. Finally, with all this systematically logically following out, when you know the truth, it will set you free. Again, let me go through that whole process. Not everything you see is all there is. The way things are is not always the way they were designed. Therefore, truth transcends experiences. Reality transcends experiences. And therefore, truth is transcendent. Reality is transcendent, but it is knowable. And then finally, when you know the truth or you know reality, it will set you free. So according to that concept, when you encounter bondage or enslavement to life, the principal postures for us that we're not yet living in a truth perspective. When Jesus spoke these words, he speaks of knowing the truth and setting us free and that the truth itself would be the factor that sets us free. It would be the knowledge or the knowing, the intimacy of reality. Well, when he's talking about this truth, he's actually speaking about the gospel or the words that he is speaking in that moment. But the principle of truth is seen here as well. When you know truth or reality, you can begin to fundamentally see any scenario moving from bondage into an experience of freedom. So all of this reminds us 
of how horribly qualified we are to authoritatively anchor reality in our own perspectives. Our wounds, our losses, our griefs have predisposed us to hypervigilance, imagination exaggeration, and catastrophizing. Our emotional evolution from traumas positions us to see reality in skewed interpretations, just real. Even with massive emotional feelings of conviction, even though we have these deep, deep convictions, we can be completely outside of reality. Those skewed filters that I've spoken of, these traumas, these losses, these griefs, these skewed filters include who we believe we are, what we believe it takes to survive, and how we assess for whether we belong. Identity outside of an authoritative anchor compels us to a performance mindset. That's to pursue and validate our worth. Our survival and belonging is framed from a hypervigilance to outsmart, outpace, outrun, and outperform in, in anything that we do. It's about a perspective that we have to work for it. We have to gain it. We don't yet have it. We're not worthy. We're not valuable. So we've got to do whatever it takes to keep people's attention, to stay in, in, uh, in, in step and in, in keep the pace with everybody who we care about. Because if we don't, we lose our sense of self. We, we're, we're worthless. And it's exhausting. And it multiplies anxiety. And therefore, it multiplies our need to self-medicate or completely shut down. Self-medicate would be what addicts do. Self-medicate would be what alcoholism is. Self-medicate would be what people do when they are pursuing porn. Uh, it, it's what people do when they're looking for uh, gambling, something that give them a high, a buzz. It's what people do when they rage. Self-medicating is, is I don't feel anything right now because I've so suppressed the stories of my past. And so I've got to rage about everything, anything, anything that happens. It's just, ah, volcanic explosion. What is that? It is the attempt to feel something so that it can mitigate all that anxiety. It's the attempt to medic medicate anxiety. It's what we do whenever we, we eat when we're not hungry. Or it causes us to completely shut down. That's where we no longer show up. We don't feel. We don't, we don't present ourselves. And this is why 70% of pastors report having ongoing struggles with depression. So from a Christian worldview, our identity finds its strength in being a bearer of God's image. Again, from a biblical or Christian worldview, our identity finds its strength in being a bearer of God's image. So how does this work? How does being a bearer of God's image actually cement, strengthen? How, how does it knit together the fabric of our being so that we have a healthy identity? Well, I have value and I have worth because I bear God's image. As a God-created human, I have the capacity to love. Uh, just consider that. As a God-created human, I have the capacity. I want you to notice the use of my words. I have the capacity. It doesn't even mean I'm doing it. it. doesn't mean I'm executing on it. It just means I have the capacity. As a God-created human, I have the capacity to love with the unique keys that fit other human hearts. I have the capacity to love with the unique keys that fit other human hearts. My value isn't what I do to perform. My value is that I was created with a capacity to connect, see, feel, and know someone else's heart. A lot of people get confused when they see mission value versus human worth. And to illustrate mission value, think of a professional sports figure. In Kansas City, we think of Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. He has pinned a contract that's worth about $500 million dollars. It takes your breath away. That is the value, $500 million, the value proposition the team executives believe he will add to the profitability of the organization. Again, the value proposition that Patrick Mahomes will add to the profitability of the organization they deem is worth $500 million. But is that Patrick's human worth? 
That's his mission value to the organization, but is that his human worth? His value to the team is actually based on a very small list of competency skills. His value is about being a uniquely gifted quarterback. And so it is worth $500 million because people are willing to pay for that. But that is not Patrick's human worth. And when you get those ideas confused, if they are overlapping, if they are enmeshed, I promise you, you're going to struggle with grandiosity. You're going to fantasize about things that one day somewhere out there in space, you may be able to be loved and belong. You may be able to survive. You may be able to be happy. Well, human worth, according to what God speaks of, is not about your small list of competency skills. The truth is that in in uh, most of our lives, like Patrick's skill set, if he had have been raised 20 years, uh, sorry, uh, 100 years, 200 years ago, um, he would not have been able to express the gifts uniquely that he does in football. They may have shown up in another set of environments and had some kind of mission value placed on them, but it's very possible that if he had been a farmer, that his skill set that is worth $500 million today wouldn't have been worth much back then. I want you to consider how weird <laughs> and how changeable, how malleable all of that is. I think, again, if you think of human worth, ask anybody on their deathbed what they wish they could do over. They will never say, I wish I could have added more wins and achievements to my team. Never, ever, not once. But they will say, I wish I could go back and enjoy the people in my life they, that I uh, care about most. Now think about it. What they're expressing is human worth, human value. Human worth is about our capacity. It doesn't even mean if you do it well or not. Your human worth is that you have the capacity. And the beauty is, is that you can grow and actually become good at being present. That's it just being present. It's the capacity. Your human worth is not about doing, it is about being the image of God, having the human capacity to connect, see, feel, and know someone else's heart. That's all because we were created in God's image and are the key to unlocking someone's heart. Let me break in one more time and tell you about RedInkRevival.com. That is R-E-D-I-N-K Revival.com. I want to encourage you to go there and sign up for our blog e-newsletter. Is every month it will hit your inbox with a blog post and new special events that will ink your soul with revival. Here are some scriptural references to truth. And I want you to think about them in the context of identity and self-definition. Of course, the most famous is the one that I've already spoken of. Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, which is the gospel, you are my disciples indeed. You're my students, my learners, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So specifically in context, he's saying that when you know the truth from God's perspective, the gospel of what God thinks about you, it will make you free. The opposite is true, that if you're in bondage, you haven't yet come to the reality of your identity. Again, if you're in bondage, you haven't yet come to the reality of your identity. He says, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. The principle here is also, when you learn the truth of your story, you learn the reality of your story. Your brain is able, your heart and soul is to eliminate all the excess enemies that you have exaggerated in your imagination that are lurking in shadows around you. You're able to eliminate all those anxieties and you're able to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not my fault. It's not my fault for how I've gotten to where I am, but it's my responsibility to do something with the truth now. Jesus prayed in John 17, and he prayed to the Father that his disciples sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So notice that Jesus, he recognized that the word of God is 
truth. It is the purest form of truth. It is how we see reality. So anytime you interact with God's word, it's not just a book. It's not like interacting with Shakespeare's writings. It's not interacting with any other human document. It is literally interacting with the very nature and person of God himself. And it's filled with living power. It's truth. All you have to do to open the portals of this power is to believe what you're reading while you're reading it, to actually embrace it as true, to emotionally attach that this is true. Now, again, there's variations of interpretations of any given doctrine. However, if the Bible is truth, if the word is truth and Jesus stamped it as truth, then I think it's going to be the catalyst for which we identify or we have an objective reality of our own lives. In Psalm 33, in verse 4, the psalmist would say, For the word of the Lord is right. It's right. That's in contrast to being wrong. And right also gives you the idea of righteous or righteousness. It is literally pure. It's without holes. It's without compromise. It's right. And then he says, the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. All his work is done in truth. Everything God does, he does from a position of what is real, not from shadows, not from mixes, not from compromises, but from what is truth. And then finally, this is a, an amazing statement Jesus makes. He says in John 4, 23 and 24, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers, true, true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth, spirit and truth. Catch, capture the spirit and reality for the father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Consider that God wants our identity to be so clear that we would show up first understanding who he is and what he thinks about us, but to be honest. And to re for me, my process has been that there's things that I thought was God's stamp of identity and because I opened myself to present what I believed was his, his stamp or his mold or his, his uh, framework, it, it, because I was vulnerable to commit to something, it allowed me then to be contested at times. And, you know, I could hold on to what I believed about it until I realized maybe, maybe what I'm thinking about that isn't what I should be thinking. And so the formation of who I am, the formation of things like marriage, the formation of things like relationships, the things that have to do with parenting, the things that have to do with friendship, all that begins to get real, real reality, real clear. So you might be thinking, what can I do to strengthen my identity or self-definition when it comes to truth? Well, I would encourage you to write some things down, to practice some things, and remember that repetition builds and galvanizes neural pathways. So here's some exercises. Write down a list of things you believe, but have been afraid to say out loud. Eh, just have fun with it. Write down a list of things you believe, but have been afraid to say out loud. Things about morality, faith and spirituality, politics, specific individuals, your relationships, just in the umbrella of what they are. How would you label them? What do you think of them? What do you believe about them? Or about God himself? Things that are worshipful all the way to things that you're angry and lamenting over. Write down what you think and feel about things. And what you're doing is you're just expressing inside of you this capacity to commit, commit to a belief or a value. So amazing. So I encourage you to write that list. Then here's another one. Write down a list of things that you would say, yes, these things I believe. And then a list of things where you say, no, these are things I don't believe. And 
I don't know. These are, these are things I don't know what I believe. I just don't know what I believe about it. So write down a list of these questions. Write down these things. Again, yes, these are things I believe. No, these are things I don't believe. And I don't know. These are things I don't know what I believe. What you're doing is you're just exercising thought, focus, and your ability to make sense and understanding of some things. So number three, number three, this is your third list. Write down a list of these questions. What do I think is important? What are my values? What are my morals? What do I tend to protest? And this is instinct. So again, we're not just trying to put down a logical, okay, I've got to have a tactical approach. I've got to mark boxes. I've got to finish this project. Now, what if you were to say, I'm just looking for what really already happens in me? Right now, what, what is already important to me? What is already my values? What are already my morals? What do I already protest? What is it that kind of ticks me off? What, 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 do I, what do I do in these situations? You might even ask this question. What, what do I have emotional opinions on? I mean, it's just, I, I'm very strong about some ideas. How, how do I tend to profile specific individuals? You know, I, I see them, maybe I'll see them on social media. I see them and immediately these are the thoughts I have. These are the emotions I have. Maybe somebody who was in my life prior is not in my life now and I'm sad about it. Maybe I'm angry about it. Maybe they did some things that eliminated them from my life themselves. They self-elected because of the way they wanted to. And it's, and it's like, it just hurts my heart. So what you're doing is you're simply identifying what what's happening in you and, and how you profile. Maybe you think somebody's a narcissist. You're like, well, I don't believe in judging people. I'm not telling you to judge them as in condemning or with contempt, but to be able to judge a tree by its fruit is something that Jesus would have us to do, is to kind of understand people. And the truth is that if you hold that with a feeling or heart of connection rather than isolation and complete separateness, you will be able to uh, pivot and say, you know what? I was totally wrong. I got around them a little bit more and I realized, no, they're not a narcissist. They're not crazy. I just, for some reason, sized them up that way. But you're committing to things. You're exploring things. You might even ask, what are your, you know, what are my clarifying intuitions about subjects? I have this intuition. Some things just don't sit right with me. What are those? And the people that don't sit right with me. Or how about this? How do I understand and process how other people are reacting to me? Or they're just acting in general? How, how do I process that? What happens in me? And what's my belief about that? Where do I turn the belief? Is Do I turn the belief on me or do I keep it focused on them? So you write all of these lists. I've given you three different kinds of lists you can exercise with. And I'm, I'm telling you, you may think that's just busy work. It's not busy work. If you'll do it, it will begin to make uh, normal the experiences of, oh, I'm now connecting the neural pathways and galvanizing that this is what I believe and I'm committed to these beliefs. Or I've decided I don't want to commit that I believe anything about that yet, but I commit to that. So you write these three lists and then here's what you do. This is so important. And this is second to last. This is number four on this uh, exercise list. You have three different lists and now number four that is the most important of all of them. Now review the list and ask yourself, all three lists, ask yourself this question. What does scripture inform me of on what is true or real about each one of these? Again, you're measuring your beliefs, your thoughts, your sense of value, your morals, and you're asking yourself, what does scripture inform me of on what is true, biblically, what is true about these? That's number four. All you're doing is you're going down the line with all those things you've written down and you're asking, what does scripture inform me of? Now, inevitably, you're going to find some gaps, spreads, and some opposing viewpoints that you have between uh, what you feel, think, and believe and what God says in scripture. That's amazing. Inevitably, you're going to. And because of that, 
You're going to have an instinct to judge yourself, be harsh, to be critical, or to disconnect from God himself. So you have to approach number five. When you find these gaps, spreads, and oppositions between what God says in scriptures and where you identify uh, emotionally, you've got to approach it without judgment of yourself, without harshness, and without critique. And uh, ask yourself, and write down why, why you think you have evolved away from truth on this topic. Not, to, not with judgment, just curiosity. Where do you think the injuries in your life came from that fused you with the suffering of others? To the point that you might be willing to drift away from things that are true or real. Again, no self-judgment here, just curiosity and open exploration. What you're doing is, is you're allowing yourself space to grow and to explore. And God holds you there with great love and great joy. Well, I hope uh, you do each one of these exercises. I hope you do the whole thing, all five. And I think you're going to be shocked as to what you find. And you may be deeply believing things now that aren't even accurate. And therefore, they're not true. So those are the three components to your identity. And in the wrap up, self-definition or identity has the three components of A-R-T, art, awareness, responsibility, and truth. If you add two more components to the end of art, this is the two components of self-regulation. It's S, standing up. So that's arts, plural, standing up. This is about courage. And then U, U, Y-O-U, so it's artsy, artsy, which is about holding on to yourself when you show up. These are the five components to self-differentiation. And because differentiation is an art, the Eumaturian, we have the five-letter acrostic for the five components of differentiation. It's the acrostic artsy, A-R-T-S-Y. I love that. Well, we're going to continue next week with these remaining two components of self-differentiation, and we're creating wholehearted leaders as we go along. We do this through theology, psychology, and neuroscience. I hope you're finding all of these podcast episodes helpful for your life. If you're a pastor and desire to do this work with your staff, I'd love to partner with you in the work. I'm a, uh, I am now guest speaking on Sundays as well as providing separate life-changing leadership, personal growth, and emotional wholeness experiences. I do things on Zoom uh, for entire staffs. Would love to help in any way that I can partner with you. So reach out and we can customize our products and service packages to your context. You can reach me at Norris, Norris, N-O-R-R-I-S dot Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C-K at gmail.com. Uh, you all have a great, great week and we will see you next time.